Professor Willard, thank you for coming again to Berlin and visit us to our yearly conference. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, it is always a pleasure having you here. And uh, I'd, like to have, I'd like to ask you a few things and uh, to have your impression and to, to know your feelings about uh, some, uh, some issues that we have been discussing in the past. So we'll start with some very sim simple things, just to have your impressions. So you are obviously a very well-known international lecturer and you travel all around the world. How is your relationship with the osteopathic community around the world? I teach in a osteopathic college at, in the United States, so situation there is a little bit different in that we are educating them both to be osteopathic in their thinking and capable of performing as a physician. Uh, the shift to instructing in colleges outside of the U United States actually seems to go very well. I have uh, enjoyed enormously uh, working with Students, they, they, their questions are usually very similar, and their their uh, their need to know their uh, the information that they're seeking is usually very much the same. So, uh, it, it's to a great extent, it, there's, there's, it's almost a seamless transition when you do do that. Yeah. Um, how did you really get into the osteopathic world to start with? Well, I, I grew up in Portland, Maine, at least for the first 10 or 12 years of my life. And there was a physician who lived across the street that we just knew as a doctor. And I had no idea that he was an osteopath. I played with his sons. And uh, I moved away from Portland. And Years later, I, I was going to college in Maine and really wanted to stay in Maine. And Maine had no medical school. And at about that time, they decided to build a medical school. That is, the allopathic community did. And the osteopathic community was trying to build a medical school. The osteopathic community won. They managed to get their school up and running and then the state legislature would not support two, so they did not support the allopathic school. This didn't seem to be, to me, it didn't, you know, it was a medical school. It was a place that they wanted to know anatomy, so I got involved with them and eventually got on their, got, got a faculty position. And I happened to notice that the, uh, one of the, young men that I grew up with. He lived right across the street. His father was a doctor, uh, was also on the, the, the faculty. He was part of the, what you'd call clinical faculty. He was not at the college, but he was practicing out in the community and the students would go there for uh, rotation. So I contacted him. Uh, his name was Jim Jealous. And he uh, and I kind of renewed our acquaintance and uh, Jim asked if I would talk to his group on the anatomy of the ear. I was researching the ear at the time. And I thought, fine. And I went and spent a weekend with, or spent a Saturday with his group. The intensity of their questions and their, the, their, where they took me in that week was uh, daunting. I mean, it was, it was interesting. It was very good. And um, one thing led to another, and he asked me to speak to their national meeting. It was the, this was the uh, Sutherland Cranial Teaching Foundation. And then an, another osteopathic group asked if I would speak, and it just sort of went from there. So it, it, um, I actually didn't go out looking for them, and I don't think they were looking for me, but they, we collided. And uh, it, after that, the different schools began asking if I would come, and, and uh, I started getting invitations to come over to England. And it just sort of grew from there. But, uh, I went to that osteopathic college in 1983, and been there. Uh, this is probably my 34th or 35th year, which 
in academia, this is actually not the common mm. scenario. You usually change multiple yeah. different yeah, especially times. In the States, you know, yes. And uh, I've stayed there. I've really, uh, it was just a good fit at the start, and it uh, still is a pretty good fit. <laughs> Very good. Um, we will we'll, we'll turn to some more osteopathic anatomical questions now. Um, one of the principles osteopaths have been using in their daily work is uh, considering the interrelationship between structure and function. So this has been for many, many years one of the main principles we have used and applied in practice. What is your view on this principle from an anatomic perspective? Uh, yeah. First off, uh, the concept of structure and function, the interrelatedness, actually is not new to the osteopathic profession. It was it was uh, known for, I mean, it was the basis for pretty much everything. Uh, I When in graduate school, that was something they preached to us. You know, if you could understand the structure of something, you can then understand the function. If you're going to learn physiology, you need to know what you're dealing with. Now, to a great extent, I think a lot of medicine's gotten away from that. And you're getting people trained where they are studying a uh, molecular biology component of something that they do not really know exactly what it is, but it's an interesting thing and they've plated it in culture and they're studying and often they're not even certain where that those cells came from. So I, I think science has to a certain extent drifted a bit from that original premise, but most of what I learned uh, in my training was all based on the concept of uh, the interrelatedness of structure and function, and if you change the structure of something, you can negate or alter the function significantly. So it wasn't a new concept to me at all, and I think it's, it, for a premise in a medical profession, it's an excellent one. It's a good way to start. And it is actually one that a lot of basic science at this point in time should actually would probably benefit by taking, um, <laughs> renewing their roots and looking at that again. And <clears throat> being an anatomist, do you study structure or do you study function? Well, a lot of what we work with, hard to say. Hard to say. I mean, because if we're going to study something, we're also going to try and stress it or move it or, or look at how it's, uh, what is it doing to the body this time? How can we isolate it and uh, pull on it and see what things respond to it? So it, it's, it's uh, not, you, you really can't, it, just descriptive anatomy for the sake of descriptive anatomy probably, that's, I mean it's still done, but it, it more often than not ends up being kind of a waste of time in, if you cannot anchor it into, say, a functional aspect. You, you, you talk about uh, sort of anchoring it in a clinical aspect. What you're really talking about is, you know, how is it working and what happens when it doesn't work? And that's really where, where most of what we're doing is focused. Yeah. So talking about structures, there are a few structures in osteopathy that are considered to be very important. For example, in cranial osteopathy, we always talk about the dura and the dura membranes and the reciprocal tension membranes. And uh, we, we always thought and we always worked thinking of the dura being attached to certain areas like C2 and the cervical spine and the sacrum and therefore linking the pelvis to the upper to the upper segments. What what is your view on the dura? Well, I have gotten a number of people angry on that one. Um, first off, you not one size fits all, so you can't really say that the dura is behaving in an adult the way in which it behaved in an infant. In an infant, the bones are literally floated in the membrane, and that membrane is the future dura, right? and it functions a lot like a 
reciprocal tension membrane in the sense that it's being forced outward by the growing brain and it is floating these bony plates. Not a problem understanding that, it's pretty clear. The dura as an adult probably has a different function. Uh, one, one thing to, to bear in mind is the difference between data and hypothesis. Data is what you collect, it should be organized, it should be re something you can replicate. Uh, you should have descriptions that other people can follow to get that same piece of data. Um, your hypothesis is actually what you think of that data, and your hypothesis is made to be attacked. Uh, this is not unique to the osteopathic world, but when somebody makes a hypothesis, it often becomes their child, their baby, their, uh, uh, and they are then going to take umbrage at anyone who speaks against it. Um, in truth, speaking against a hypothesis is making it stronger. Because if it's wrong, you're going to knock it down. If it's right, you can't knock it down. And that's the benefit to it. So having said that, I don't think the dura has anything to do with what you're feeling in the adult. Uh, it is attached all the way down the posterior longitudinal ligament. It's attached to varying degrees of firmness. We see it attached in the newborn. And we see it attached in the adult and we see it attached whether it is a fixed specimen or not. And um, that, of course, flies in the face of sacred beliefs, but um, in many senses, sacred cows make the best hamburger. And it's just, uh, I think in Gray's Anatomy, where they said it's firmly attached, which I think was the wording, to C2 and to the sacrum is, is actually correct, but it's also attached all the way down to a lesser degree, uh, sometimes firmly, sometimes not, uh, but it's certainly attached, such that if you pull one end of it, it's not going to make a big difference with the distal, distal end. So that shouldn't be considered negative towards the osteopathic profession. That's not questioning what they're feeling. It's questioning how they explain it, and that's a huge difference. Uh, if they are unwilling to allow questioning to their hypotheses, they're not going anywhere. They're going to die as a uh, kind of useless profession. If they are willing to have their hypotheses questioned and then react and respond and engage with fact, that's a whole different story. It will survive. Now, what could possibly be causing this, these palpatory feelings? So if you look at some of the work that's done by Nelson and Galanik, then there's a very good chance that what you're actually palpating is tissue perfusion. It makes a lot more sense to me. And in the spinal column, there's a massive venous plexus that is both peripheral, superficial, and deep, right in the vertebral column itself. And it's all interconnected at every single level. A lot of it's controlled by vasodynamic changes orchestrated by sympathoadrenal activity. And in fact, the rhythms that, that, that many of the practitioners record actually correlate with the rhythms of this sympathoadrenal activity. So I think the evidence is actually very good that you may be doing something like this. And when you modify it by taking it to a still point, you may actually be evacuating some of these vascular plexuses, which would be very good. And then when you let it go and it bounces back with a lot more vitality, you may be introducing um, a variation into the cardiovascular cycle, which may be a very good thing as well. So I think there's some really positive ways of looking at it. It's time to really probably get rid of some of the, the nonsense that's carried on. But, uh, and as I said, if, if they do not want to let go of things that aren't sustainable, that will be to the detriment of the profession in the long term. If they 
willing to look at new information and incorporate it into their their uh, their um, practices, then the re the profession has vitality. Well, thank you for this very thorough <laughs> explanation. One one structure that has been studied lately, I would say, maybe in the last twenty years, very extensively, is fascia. What is your definition of fascia? Well, it's probably not one that the osteopaths want to hear, but it's you have to any definition of fascia has to be something that is can be replicated. So such that I could give it to you. You could turn around, go out that door and go into a gross anatomy lab and using that definition you could identify fascia. Um, Calling it a biodynamic reciprocal tension, self-healing matrix, proprioceptive matrix, doesn't do anything. Uh, body's basically that, okay? And fascia is part of the body, great. But it doesn't help you understand what fascia is. Uh, the old definitions, which are the accurate ones, given in most textbooks, at least the older ones, would be that that tendons, ligaments, and ponderotic sheaths typically have very well organized collagenous fibers. So they will resist strain in one or several different directions. Uh, and there will be directions in which they don't resist strain very well and will shred. Fascia, on the other hand, really consists of irregular woven connective tissue. It doesn't resist pull in any one direction maximally, but it will resist pull in all directions very well. So it becomes a packing tissue, and it, it honestly doesn't say whether it's loose or dense. So my definition of fascia, and it's not mine, the anatomical definition of fascia, is that it's connective tissue with, it's, it's connective tissue with irregular um, collagenous fiber weave regardless of the density of the collagenous fibers. I would have it actually probably a much broader tolerance for what fascia is than a lot of other anatomists because I would follow that description and say, well, if you've got some loose connective tissue in the submucosa of the gastrointestinal system, it's packing tissue, it's resisting movement in multiple different directions, then it's probably a form of fascia. Now you could call that visceral fascia if you wanted to. It's, there's there's uh, t ten, uh, connective tissue in and around the, uh, the organ systems in the gut. Purists would say, well, this is not fascia because fascia is only musculoskeletal, but I don't know where that definition is ever written to include only musculoskeletal. It's not in the books. Uh, basically, you have tissue around the organ systems with consists of fascia, uh, connective tissue with an irregular weave of collagen. It's fascia. Visceral fascia derives from splanchnic mesoderm. Uh, right beside it is somatic mesoderm. That's going to give rise to the somatic fascia. So I can see very clearly that you have visceral and somatic fascia. Where I draw, would draw a line is uh, sticking with the idea of the irregular weave of the connective tissue as identifying the fascia uh, versus uh, being able to include muscle in it and bone in it because it's, say, politically acceptable at this time to include it because this person happens to work on muscle and wants to be part of the Congress. You talked very briefly when you were saying, when you were giving your explanation of the Jura uh, about vitality. Mm -hmm. And one structure that has been considered in osteopathy as a very vital structure, and the founder of Osteopathy 8 is still already mentioned this in his writings uh, more than 100 years ago, is the diaphragm. Is it really a vital structure? Well, the diaphragm gets its its contribution to our vitality is based on its geometry. And so as a muscle, it's no different than any other muscle. Uh, but its geometry places it in a position where it can assist us tremendously in one, respiration, two, movement of fluids throughout the body. 
um, probably vis-a-vis -vis the movement of fluids, metabolic health, health, uh, wellness as well. So it's more so than perhaps, say, the biceps or flexor carpi ulnaris or something of that nature. The diaphragm does have this role in maintaining ventilation and assisting in tissue perfusion and assisting in the return of lymphatic fluid. So it's got a fairly significant role that way. Uh, but fundamentally, it's, it is skeletal muscle. Evidently, does not have as rich a spindle population as most of our uh, skeletal muscle involved with movement of, say, the arms or the eyes or something of that nature. So it is slightly different. But it is uh, its fundamental construct is, is skeletal muscle. It just happens that its geometry places it in a position of being very important in terms of perfusion and respiration. One last question is um, concerning research. Hmm. Are there any areas of obviously research in anatomy? that you would like to explore, that you haven't done in your long career and that you didn't manage to get into? Or do you see any areas that uh, we should explore more? Well, I, I began having a really strong fascination with the central nervous system and the development of the central nervous system. That area has exploded with research. It's very sophisticated research and it's getting some very interesting results. I think in terms of the area that I have really become most interested in right now is a shift to a somewhat different perspective. Our, our posture, our ability to withstand gravity, our ability to move as in as fluid a fashion as we can, seems to involve not just muscle movement, but the way in which the muscles are incorporated into the supportive fascial construct. And I'm, I, I've been interested in that for a long time, but I'm, I'm actually getting into that area now with some of the research that I'm doing with uh, Mark Schenke and Andrea Valeming. And it's just proving to be actually very fascinating in the, the, the uh, just, just if you think about, say, the lumbar spine, you could take the five lumbar vertebrae and precariously balance them on a table so they would actually stand up, but not very well. Yet, they exist in our spine, and they take, I look at the average rugby player, they take quite a lot of abuse, and they still function. How is it that those five bones can float the way they do into a matrix of fascia, a fascial stocking, supported by muscle, and perform? That's, I think, the thing that I'm finding most interesting. Thank you very much for your time, and oh, thank, thank you, you for your contribution to the anatomical and osteopathic world. And uh, we hope to see you soon again. All right. Thank you very much.